Welcome to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. I am Dr. John, the guide for your heroic journey towards greater health, success, and most importantly, happiness. And now, on with the show. Hi, this is Dr. John, and I am thrilled to announce that Jory and I are opening up our retreat in beautiful Costa Rica from September 28th of 2024 to October 5th. Everyone wants fulfilling relationships. The hard part is love is not enough. So many factors can get in the way preventing ongoing connection, intimacy, and aligned growth. All healthy relationships start within. But when we have unresolved stuff, it can easily interfere with those we are seeking to be closest with. Whether you're in a long-term committed partnership or are single and are looking for love, this retreat will guide you in the heroic journey of healing yourself so that you can be open and available to cultivate the fulfilling relationships you desire and deserve. To find out more, visit joryrose.com slash retreats. That's J-O-R-E-E-R-O-S-E dot com slash retreats. Hey, everybody. This is Dr. John back with another episode of the Evolved Caveman podcast. And I am here today with my lovely and talented partner in life and love, Jory Rose. Hello, sweetheart. Hello, love. And today we are going to talk about why intensive therapy seems to be one of the better ways to deal with problems in relationship. And so we are subtitling this, Love Isn't Enough, to market as one of our new up-and-coming entrees into relationship coaching, relationship counseling, and to highlight our new site, loveisn'tenough.net. Yeah, thank you for us so much for sharing all that information. I am so excited for what we are building and creating in the relationship coaching world, bringing both of our long careers in the field of mental health, coupled with our passion for serving others and helping them live happier lives, but really bringing our backgrounds together combined with our personal relationship experience and insights and growth into helping others really heal in their relationships. So it's it's exciting. So any of you listening out there who is sensing your relationship could get to another level or another area of healing or depth or connection, I'm excited you're listening because we've got a lot more to share on this. Yeah. And as, as you pointed out to me earlier today, this podcast is being recorded on the one year anniversary of you and I going to see Charlie and Linda Bloom in Santa Cruz, who are excellent at what they do. And we went to see them for a two day, 12 hour intensive couples counseling session. So it was six hours a day for two days. So as I like to always do, and you always appreciate the way I, I do so, can I give some context to that? Sure. In case someone's listening who hasn't listened to any of our joint past episodes or don't know some of our history, we have been together for almost eight and a half years now mm -hmm. and engaged for almost half of that length of time as well. And while when we first met, we knew this was different. This is the person I've been looking for, the relationship I wanted to build. We still had challenges. And especially as two therapists, that really fucked with our heads a bit. I, at least for me, it's like, oh, it's frustrating as hell. It was horrible. We teach this stuff. Why can't we do this? And mounting small little paper cuts that grew into some bigger wounds in our relationship led to a short but devastatingly painful breakup for both of us. And when you, you know, well, at one of the points of our challenges, I had asked you to go to therapy and that really triggered you. Mm -hmm. And that frustrated me too. If you're a therapist, don't you want to go to therapy? Well, and I think, you know, at that point I was in a depressive state. You were. And so I was having a hard time getting out of my own black and white thinking. I was having a hard time seeing the good in the relationship. And I think I was highly sensitive and defensive. Yeah. I, I love the story and I'm just going to share this for a good little comedic relief as we enter into the intensive therapy work. But when we did that first therapy session, um, way before we met Charlie and Linda, we were sitting, in, <laughs> we were sitting in the lobby of the therapist's office and I like things to be orderly and aligned and organized. And 
I see the lampshade in front of me that was crooked where the seam of the lampshade was facing out into the room versus perhaps towards the back of, of the wall. So I got up and I shifted the lampshade. And I thought, oh, shit, he's going to use this against (laughs) me in therapy. Why did I do that? And it was evidence of the the negative lens you were seeing through that when the therapist first asked, why did you choose Jory? What do you appreciate about her in this relationship? And her first response was my list of negatives that started with the lampshade. And and I, I wanted to share with that because six months later when we were working at getting back together after really only having been broken up for about six weeks. And I said, okay, well, I need to go to therapy. Like that's a non-negotiable for me. And you took the initiative to find Charlie and Linda, which I was so happy with given the challenge of the first attempt to go get support. That's why I gave that previous lampshade story because it was Mm -hmm. a really, really big deal to me that not only did you find Charlie and Linda, but what you came back to me was, hey, so they've come highly recommended. And by the way, are you up for a two-day, six-hour-per-day, 12-hour intensive? And given the resistance of a one-off, two-hour therapy session, to me, that you took that initiative and had that courage and dedication to sit through 12 hours of therapy over two days, that was almost enough for me to say he's committed. He's in, he's willing. Well, and let's back up a little bit because I think that dynamic that we got into or that I was in, I think is probably more common than we realize. In other oh, words, yeah. you know, I think many couples and, and you know, you, we've seen this many times, right? Like us and, and other couples, when you start to date, Typically, you see your new partner is all positive. They can do no wrong. They walk on water. Their breath doesn't smell in the morning. Like, it's just, (laughs) it's like, oh my God, she's amazing. Rose colored lenses. Yeah. Is that a pun? Mm. Jory Rose? Anyway. um, (laughs) But over time, those paper cuts accumulate. The paper cuts of little hurts, annoyances, resentments, being ignored. And so your lens goes from all positive to mostly or all negative. And I Mm -hmm. I think I was at that point where, and I I didn't even really have an awareness of it. I just knew I was stuck. Well, and and what was hard for me was I knew you didn't have an awareness of that. And because of the depressive cycle you were in, you couldn't hear my feedback mm -hmm. without defensiveness or externalizing. So that was really a hard point. And and think about how how many couples are in that state going when, by the time they go to therapy, couples counseling, and then one or both of them are so depressive, so resigned, so disbelieving that change is possible, that couples therapy is ineffective. Well, and we also know from research that couples usually wait about six years before getting into therapy. So those paper cuts and those wounds really accumulate and give more confirmation bias of nothing's going to work. So how often yeah. are they really open-minded when they actually get there? Well, and and part, you, you mentioned confirmation bias. And I think that was one of my issues was that I had this negative lens over my eyes. And then I started looking for things to confirm my negative outlook. Right. Like the, you know, moving the, adjusting the lamp in the waiting room was evidence to me of rigid thinking. Right. And it it just, it's, you know, that be careful what you look for because you just might find it. And so if you're always looking for what's wrong, you're going to find it. And that just hastens the exit of the relationship. Well, and then you add in the fear of going to therapy in which the therapist's job is to refute your confirmation bias. And yeah. if you're not open and willing to look for the evidence against right? Then it, it keeps you stuck in you, a desire to stay stuck in the narrative. I always ask the question, how is it serving you to stay stuck? Right. Yeah, if, I love if that question. To journey, to journey forward is to get unstuck. Well, then why don't people get unstuck more often? And it's often easier to stay stuck than it is to get unstuck because well, and, the, 
Well, can I just say that Yeah. to get unstuck requires self-reflection of what's my role in this? What, what do I need to look at? Because it's really easy to externalize. And we also have to be willing to shift our narrative, to shift our viewpoint. Well, and I think along the, that point, I was really, at that point in time, a very typical male. Um, because that, that session, and we only had one because of me, did not go well. Mm-hmm. And it was embarrassing to me. And I knew I kind of fumbled the ball and yet I couldn't get past my own negative, uncomfortable emotions to really get to a deeper level. So I was stuck in anger fueled by, you know, probably a depressive state, some embarrassment, some guilt, some shame. And what you, and what you later discovered was shame, that yeah. embarrassment around the, in a, or the challenge of getting through some of those difficult emotional yeah. states. Because I, I think one of my biggest challenges has always been managing those negative emotions at the most difficult times. Right. And one of the things that, and we're kind of jumping a little back and forth in timeline that we've discovered. And I, I think my biggest challenge was I knew that some of those things leading to those experiences that were very present for you wasn't about me. It was stuff from your childhood or from your marriage. And those wounds were being activated by something I may have done, but they weren't caused by me. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I couldn't be the one to heal them at the deeper level, which is, you know, bringing it back to our present work that we've created in Love Isn't Enough is recognizing relational therapy, relational work, the tools, the skills are only as effective as you doing your own inner work. And that's what we were able to, I think, recognize by the time we went to Charlie and Linda of, this isn't just about she's rigid thinking she's going to fix the lampshade, then that's going to translate to maybe she's going to nitpick me and I expect perfection. I mean, there's a lot of ways it could, you know, how does it really affect you and the relationship? And seeing for me what (laughs) turning the lampshade meant for you and looking at other areas in my life in which what are my expectations unrealistic? What am I being rigid in my thinking around or my inability is one of the phrases you often say, being open to your influence. So, and, and it went both ways because the, the irony was you were quite rigid in your thinking at that time, right? At that time, for sure. Yeah. Well, and let's, let's contrast kind of our experience with that first, what was that? A one or two hour session it was two hours versus the intensive with Charlie and Linda, because I think there's some illuminating points to be made there. For example, one of the, one of the drawbacks of typical couples counseling, which is an hour or two hours is you, you're kind of working on the surface. You're not getting very deep because you don't have the time to go very deep um, generally. And the, the other thing that's interesting about it is the issues just get brought up, the uncomfortable negative emotions get stirred up, and then you're, it's about time to leave and you got to go home in the car with this person. And, and that also was sucky you're both because that was an hour. That was an hour away too. So we were stuck in a horrible car drive home. But even before that, because that's the, you know, very obvious difference of a longer session versus a shorter session. But right off the bat, and we see this generally speaking. So I apologize if the listener doesn't resonate with this part, but from a general state, usually the women are, are kind of quote, dragging the men into therapy. So right off the bat, the husband or partner, is felt to be on the defense. And I know that that therapy session scared the fucking shit out of you. It did. And you didn't want to be there. You were willing to go, but you didn't want to be there. Whereas with Charlie and Linda, you were ready to take, I mean, you took that initiative. So Mm -hmm. you were ready to say, Hey, I'm not willing to lose this relationship. I lost it for a short period of time. I will do everything I can to get it back. So my willingness to show up was very different. Well, well. And, and that's one of the things I like about the model we've created is because I, I think typically couples go into couples counseling and more often than not, you've got a female counselor 
mm-hmm. which most men already going in are going to be defensive, maybe a little mm-hmm. bit depressive, maybe a little bit annoyed, if not downright angry. And then they're going to pretty quickly, I think, feel ganged up on mm-hmm. whatever the truth is, mm-hmm. right? I think if you've got that negative lens over your eyes, you're going to see, you're going to feel like it's two against one. And that's not a great recipe for success. We're trying to reduce defensiveness, not incite it. And so for our model, you know, what I love about this model we've created is not only are, not only are we working on individual work and the relational work simultaneously, which we think is an absolute must, but we've also got a male and a female therapist. So I can meet with the husband, you can meet with the wife, we build rapport with them. So when we go into the couple session with all four of us, everyone has someone in their corner that can speak mm-hmm. for them or defend them or explain what they were thinking or feeling, which I know at times in the past, I would get emotionally flooded and had a hard time speaking in some of these right. emotionally charged conversations. Right. Right. Yeah. Th- this model is really supportive. And especially for men who are resistant to therapy, you build great rapport with men because you are very much masculine and very much emotionally aware, communicative. So you get to highlight that they can still be manly and feel deeply. You role model Mm -hmm. that, which men I think need to see both. Cause I think that's one of the fears of therapy. If I get too emotional, will I still be seen as masculine? If I, will I look weak? Will I look insecure? How do I manage some of those man boxed you know, narratives that prevent them from feeling safe to go deeper. Yeah. Like that fear of men that you and I have talked about that if I scratch the scab, it's going to start bleeding and I'll never be able to get it to stop. In other words, if I tap into how I'm really feeling, it's going to overtake me. It's going to overwhelm me. I won't be able to control it. It's going to come out all over the place in my life. Right. Which isn't true, but it's a fear. Right. So coming back to the therapy model, And what our experience was that first two hour therapy session, you know, especially beginning in therapy, when we're coming in all charged and high full of emotion, it's hard to go back to the beginning of the relationship when it was ease and flow and deep connection, because you're not in that state. And yet two hours or even just one hour is going to leave you feeling probably worse. And I've got to wait a whole week or two. Yeah, you know what helps with that? Well, I've got some MDMA. ideas. <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard opener, going, right? Uh, it puts you in a positive emotional are state. We, are we it's going there already? Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, it's, it just crossed my mind. Um, well, yeah. But yeah, let's let's talk about, I guess, our experience in the intensive and how that was different and how we see the difference in the two models, what we see as the differences. So let's go back to where I was expressing gratitude for you for taking the initiative to finding them. and. That was really big for me. And so I'm going to say it again. Thank you. Because that your willingness to sit through 12 hours of therapy over two days really was a massive commitment to me in showing me you are worth going through this fire with. Yeah, I'm willing to fight for you. And that's one of the most powerful things you as my partner could have shown me, not just said, but shown me. Speaking of which, can I jump in there? Because I I really think along those lines, one of the most, and and I want people listening out there, I want you listener, you the listener, to be aware of this. I think one of the single most loving, most devoted acts in relationship is being willing to look at yourself and being willing to make changes for the betterment of the relationship. And so when you see that, if you see that in your relationship, make a big deal of it express gratitude, express appreciation, do it repeatedly because it's hard and it's scary, especially for men. Yeah. I I guess for women too, but women are more socialized in that direction. Right. And it's really easy. We hear this all the time. If only they would stop doing X, Y, or Z, I'll be better. It's never, I wonder what I could do for myself that would shift their response or reaction to me? Or what could I do to help him or her be less defensive when I communicate? It's always stop being so defensive. And that's that's key. The idea that you just brought up mm -hmm. of of taking radical accountability for one's own stuff. Right. 
one's own emotions, one's own words. That's huge. We got to so, stop externalizing the blame onto the other. And, you know, as we're kind of teasing this apart, it really makes me truly honor each and every one of my clients and our clients who show up with yeah. the willingness and courage. This is really hard work. And some people come to therapy and really just want someone to be listened and just, you know, have someone listen to them and share in their story. And that's healing and that's hopeful. And that's also not going to move the needle on change generally. Well, and I would that say it's very difficult work because it takes courage and it's also some of the most rewarding work you can do. Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. Because that, because that we, relationship, that primary romantic relationship is so incredibly important to your overall happiness. Yeah. And I, your success, your satisfaction with life. Like your, if your things lifespan. aren't going well at yeah. home, it, it's not going well anywhere. Well, and we often hear people say, this is the most important person in my life. <laughs> then they don't And yet, like <laughs> what are you doing to demonstrate that? Yeah. So I come back to your willingness to sit through 12 hours of therapy, especially when we had previously recognized that after about 15 minutes of a hard conversation, that that was your threshold of being flooded mm -hmm. or before getting yeah, I would, flooded. I would often get flooded. Yeah. So knowing that going into the first time, the two hour session was really triggering. What was different for you? And I'll can share my experience, but of the go, heading into a 12 hour, two day I think a big part of it was the autonomy and control that I had in setting it up and choosing who we went mm -hmm. to. Um, and I was referred to them by my friend, Dr. Jim Brampson. And that referral meant a lot to me. Like, so I had trust in what they do and who they were immediately. Mm -hmm. And also, I think my motivation to enter into therapy was much higher after our breakup, because mm -hmm. I had realized, holy shit, like, this is the person I love. We need to work harder at making the changes that need to be made. I need to work harder at making the changes I need to make. Yeah. So there was a firmer resolve. Yeah. For me, it was, it was really fascinating timing because I love leading retreats. I love being on retreat. One of the reasons I love retreat so much is the spaciousness in which we can immerse into whatever it is that we're there to do. And I had been having this thought for a while that the regular therapy model of an hour a week or every other week doesn't move the needle in a way that is going to feel fulfilling or productive for what the person is really wanting to create change around. And I had been playing with this idea of doing intensives with my clients that a four or five hour session could really give us the opportunity to dig in. Because as you mentioned a few moments ago, we get to like, we just get to the meat of the story. Now, you know, the, the time is up. Or, well, now or you we, go back into your work or your life and the chaos and the Well, right. How many of our clients, you know, we just, you know, squeeze the hour and in the middle of their day and then don't have time to integrate what it was that they were feeling. And so I had been having this thought for a while and to hear that this is what Charlie and Linda were doing really confirmed. And then we can talk in a few minutes because you mentioned the MDMA and I'd like to come back to that actually because of the science around the studies that have been coming up in which it's actually been scientifically shown to be uh, really beneficial for symptom reduction to do intensives, even without any medicine involved mm -hmm. in the therapy. So I was, I was like gung ho for this. I was, you know, this to me was fun in that I wasn't afraid fun. of going. Yes. I, 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 I truly believe that inner exploration is a fascinating journey. And I was willing to let it be hard because not only was I committed to the outcome, but Self-awareness and growth are just some of my highest values. And so I was excited for what was to be the revealed in the process and to both be in it as a couple and then to 
have the meta awareness of observing it from a therapeutic mm -hmm. role, right? And looking at Charlie and Linda, both as experts and mentors mm -hmm. while being in it and observing it. So I was all in. It was in their home, which was lovely. Mm -hmm. And six hours was hard. And, and for maybe you have different view, but I actually thought it flew by pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And when it I've done, I, go ahead. I, I was just going to say when I've done intensives with clients that are four or five hours and you and I have done a handful of mm -hmm. four hour intensives with couples, everyone's always amazed at how quickly it went by. Yeah. It gives you the space to go deeper. It gives you the space to really assimilate some of the tools that are being brought up. And I, I just think we don't have the bandwidth, like even in an hour session, you barely get into any sort of depth and already you're pulling back out and saying, oh, you know, it's time to wrap up and let's go reintroduce yourself to the crazy world of work. Right. For um, kids. But or... it, it strikes me, going back to Charlie and Linda in that intensive, it strikes me how much of the time we spent in that 12 hours going back to our pasts, not our past as a couple, mm -hmm. our past prior to ever having met. Mm-hmm. And the shit that was arising from childhood, whatever you want to call it, difficulties, challenges, trauma. Um, I seem to recall that we it. dealt with in past relationships, past marriage. Yeah. And I, I think there was a, a disproportionate, <laughs> and I'm not saying this out of judgment. It just, there was a lot for to unpack there. I even think we could have done a third day, to be honest, because mm -hmm. I felt there was a disproportionate amount on my past. Mm -hmm. And that that was fine. It's what needed to be attended to and clearly a sign of where I hadn't done my work in the way that I thought I had. Well, and, I think that was true of both of us. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I think we have done the work. It's just, there was things that, there were leftovers or holdovers for me, I'll speak for me, that were really entrenched, that, I'm not sure I believed I could change because I'd tried most of my adult life to change them and hadn't had success. And they were those unconscious defenses, unconscious defenses that are habitual, automatic, and rapid. Mm -hmm. and, and reactive. They were deep, right? They were, some of that stuff had been around since I was four. Right. Without even really having a conscious awareness of it. So you know, I, I think we have done the work and I think we continue to do the work. And I don't know that this work ever ends. Well, as you said that, the thought did came to my mind that I think you and I absolutely both did the work. And perhaps we did the work to get to the point of what did we need to do to survive? And I think what we were faced with this in this relationship was truly, I want to grow and I need something to be different, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's, I think we had done the inner work for ourselves in our own way of moving through our world. But what we've learned, especially in our relationship is the depth that we seek is also going to trigger some of our deepest stuff. Right. And luckily we are in a place where we can view those triggers as opportunities for growth points or awarenesses of, wow, look where we're still stuck. Look what's still sensitive for me. When, and just to circle back, when I was talking about my issues that I thought were intractable mm -hmm. and that I couldn't possibly change, the one I'm most, that's at the forefront of my mind, is that emotional flooding in these difficult uncomfortable conversations, disagreements, and the defensiveness that would arise, the shutdown that would ensue, and the shame that came up of, I'm just not good in relationship. She'd be better off without me. And for you guys listening, if you want to hear more of that story, we did an episode a couple of weeks ago on the anxious avoidant trap, where we go into more depth of what that dynamic looks like and how it really manifested in some unhealthy patterns that were really hard for us to get out of. And mm -hmm. I am so grateful that you made those changes because 
your ability to not get flooded and not get defensive and not shut down when I share something that might've hurt my feelings or feedback on something, your ability to receive it with care and grace, even if it's hard. And, you know, I think we've both done a great job in being able to name, like, this is hard for me right now and I can still get through this, right? We, it's not a complete shutdown. Well, one of the things I think we've realized is that we both, and I don't think I can overstate this, we both hate to disappoint or hurt the other. <laughs> and, and then oh, it's God, easy from it. there to go to, mm, I'm not worthy or, yeah, I, I, I'm all bad. At least that's I where wondered, I would go. I wonder to the extent to which couples share that sentiment or that fear of truly not wanting to disappoint their partners. I don't I, think most of us are aware. Yeah. I was just going to say, I wonder how much awareness is even around what's underneath. Because that was something I had to discover in our relationship. Mm -hmm. And I was like, holy shit, I fucking hate to disappoint or hurt joy. And yet mm -hmm. it's inevitable, right? It's yeah. going to happen. And, and so I, I think that also goes back to this idea of, you know, intention and really going back to looking at what was my partner's intention in these words or these mm -hmm. actions or the lack of action. And did they really intend to hurt my feelings? Because I really think it's, you know, most of us, it's 99 to hundred percent of the time we're trying purposefully to do right by our partner. And so it's you, it's looking at the effort or the intention over the outcome. Right. And that takes a little bit of retraining. You know, one of the things that when I work with clients, I'm always fascinated about is the difference between the details and the patterns. And the details are just what happened this past week. This is the fight we got in. This is the disagreement. This is what happened. This is what led to it. This is the context. And that's good information to have. And yet I always get really curious, what's the underlying pattern that keeps repeating regardless of the details? And that takes time to uncover. And one of the things that you and I, I know, we, I know we've talked about on previous podcast episodes, and I always ask with the couples I work with is, do you know your partner's core wound? Because many couples don't actually know what their partner's core wound is. And if you don't know your partner's core wound, it's really easy to be activating a very deep paper cut that likely was there before you ever even became partners. And the reactions, the, the survival mechanisms to defend against the hurt from our core wounds looks like a lot of acting out behaviors. Mm -hmm. And when we can have that insight, it, it's really powerful knowledge and information. It may not always change how we show up. But it's really helpful to have so we can understand there likely wasn't negative intent here. There's, you know, how can we move through these life challenges without intentionally hurting our partner's core wounds? Yeah. And I really think a lot of these disagreements or acting out behaviors or shitstorms that we get in in relationship are a result of past trauma where people just are reacting from a very emotional, deep, unconscious place. And it's not, I don't think a lot of times it's intended to hurt. It's just a defense. Yeah. Uh, you and I are both delving deep into the work of Lindsay Gibson mm -hmm. and her book, Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents, which if you haven't heard of her, she's phenomenal. Look her up, get as much information as you can about her. and. I'm doing a certification training on how to help clients uh, heal from having emotionally immature parents. And I love this quote that I, I learned in the training and one of the goals of therapy, and this speaks, I think what we're talking about, these deep core wounds that really are developmental. They start really young and they wire our brain in such a way that is going to protect us from wanting to get hurt again. Mm -hmm. Right. And the, the quote says that, you know, the goal of the work is to uncover and articulate the self-defeating solution towards safety. 
And if we can look at you shutting down, if I were to bring something up, you were seeking safety, Mm -hmm. right? Likely from an early childhood experience. And the, the challenge is it's creating a lack of safety in the relationship and not even really perhaps helping you being safe in the moment, but it was such a well-established defense mechanism of not feeling safe. And it's self-defeating because it's not creating the very thing you're you're seeking to create. Mm -hmm. And I I love that idea. And I think that is what this 12-hour intensive allowed us to do, was look for these patterns and which we thought was serving some deeper inner need that was creating a bigger problem in our partnership. And that takes time to uncover. And I like the internal family systems lens on that one too, right? That, you know, there was a part of me that got hurt when I was four or five, that the best strategy I could come up with at that time was to make sure everyone was happy, to make sure no one was getting angry, like my mom, for example. And that part of me would then come out, it gets frozen in time and that becomes a defense strategy. So when we would get in conflict, this part of me would come out and, you know, it's really like a four or five-year-old John Mm -hmm. is coming out and controlling the show. And that's not an effective way to live. Right. I remember at times even being able to ask you, what's the part of you that's acting out right now? You Mm -hmm. know, what's the part of you that's hurt? And that's, you know, two, two therapists in relationship doing a, some perhaps therapy on each other in the moment of conflict. And yet it can be a really effective question. What's the part of you that's at that, you know, that that's feeling sensitive right now. I, I also and, like that question of, is this argument really about us or mm-hmm. is this about a past relationship, i.e. like a prior marriage, or is this about your childhood? Mm-hmm. Because I don't, I mean, a lot of these arguments that we see couples get in, I would argue are more about things from the past than the present mm-hmm. argument, the present circumstances. And, and everyone will agree with me. I, you know, I'm like, like you and I got in that disconnection, that disagreement in Barcelona over me eating an hors d'oeuvre. So mm-hmm. I started without you mm-hmm. and we got disconnected for a long time. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, and I say, look, and I'll, I'll use that as an example of, we get in arguments about the dumbest shit. Like yeah. it's so insignificant, but there's something underneath the details, as you say, mm-hmm. that's important or that was important when we were four or six or, you know, 27. Right. So do me a favor, circle back. You were going to bring up the MDMA study and the placebo or the control group, actually, that control group versus the MDMA assisted therapy. So just some history on MDMA was actually created back in the early 1900s, but actually gained quite momentum in the late 60s and 70s from a local therapist here in the Bay Area who was giving it to couples for a couples therapy. And MDMA is a chemical compound that has some really amazing properties and it quiets down the defensive part of the brain while simultaneously allowing for it to be a heart opener and it elicits positive emotion and compassion. So imagine being able to take something that simultaneously is going to calm down your defensive reactions. will come down your fear response. Yeah. Right. And allow you to see through a positive lens of love and compassion being at a place of being heart centered. And see, that would have been perfect for me in that first session. Right. So in the seventies, that was used for couples therapy. And then the war on drugs happened and the whole thing got shut down. And for almost 40 years, a um, privately funded company has been doing research around MDMA and its effect on therapy. And it's looking to be legalized in California, hopefully this year for therapeutic use. Mm-hmm. But the studies are phenomenal. Uh, and well, it's been granted breakthrough status as a treatment by the FDA. Which, which Both is absolutely MDMA incredible. and psilocybin, i.e. magic mushrooms. Which was for different uh, reasons, but which was um, in addition to our couples intensive, um, both were parts of our healing journey. Mm -hmm. Um, The the mushrooms inspired us so much. We sought out 
training in psychedelic assisted therapy. Right. And for, for those who aren't certain with the, the psilocybin, with the mushrooms, at its most simplest description, it allows the brain to be open to new wiring. So it allows you to get out of those really fixed neural pathways in which you see things the way that you've been in a pattern or habit of seeing and allows you to be open-minded and to create new neural pathways and which actually can stay open. So the critical window for learning and, and, and open new experiences is huge with the psilocybin and the sense of the interconnectivity that it creates and the psilocybin being used for treatment of depression and anxiety and PTSD. Again, those studies are amazing, but the specific MDMA study I was referring to actually utilized intensives in which they would do three eight-hour intensives for for therapy. Mm -hmm. And the control group was also doing three eight-hour intensives with, I think it was 12 one-hour integration sessions. Yeah, with no MDMA. With no MDMA, right. And with the, the control group, I think the statistic was about 30% reduction of symptoms mm -hmm. just from having the eight hour intensive, which I was so thrilled with the outcome of that study because with MDMA, do you remember the exact percentage? I, I think it was more than that. I think the, the control group was like 60% reduction and the MDMA was like 80%. Was it that high? I think. We have to go I, back it, and like, look. It was pretty astounding. It was astounding. But I was, I was I would, astounded that the control group had such a positive impact. And we think that the majority of that was due to the, the setup of the, the container that was created with that intensive therapy approach. I, and I, I think it's brilliant. And I love that we can have that research to pull to support the model we really want to create for intensives. And it, it, to me, it's so intuitive as to what we're talking about. When you give yourself the time and space to enter into curiosity and holding it in a way that's compassionate, right? If you have a compassionate um, space being held by the therapist where you can be guided in the ability to regulate your nervous system when you are getting dysregulated. Because at the end of the day, that's a big thing that you know I, I use a lot with my clients. In its most simple terms, rather than saying I'm being defensive, reactive, I'm angry, I'm acting out, I'm this, I'm that. In its most simplest terms, you're dysregulated. The only goal is to get regulated. Mm -hmm. And that's just a nervous system thing. Because if I use that language, it's not personal. It's not, well, why do I have an anger issue? Or why am I so defensive? No, your nervous system is activated, which is going to lead to a set of physiological responses, which is going to lead to thought patterns, emotions, sensations, habits. And when we regulate our nervous system, it can all calm down. And we even got that new research from the Gottmans in their new book, Fight Right, in which they talk about when you're in the middle of an argument, you only have one goal. It's not to solve the argument. The only goal is to regulate so that you can come back and talk about it when you're not activated or triggered. Yeah. To talk when you're calm. Yeah. But the, the, the study on the MDMA, you know, I, I really look forward to it being legalized for therapeutic mm -hmm. use because there are so many times in which I see clients so stuck on that fear or reactivity or defensiveness and so stuck on an inability to see their partner through a lens of love and compassion and have their heart soften towards connection. And to have a substance that can do both simultaneously allows to be able to deepen the conversation to get to the root so healing can truly occur yeah well put well i'm i'm looking at time and we have to wrap up and i think this has been a wonderful conversation so thank you for joining me thank any you any closing me. thoughts um i to me it's really an invitation to the listener to get curious on your own healing journey, both individually and relationally, and recognizing healing as possible. And I've I've really tried to shift the language I use in talking to people about this because 
I think language is really powerful. And if we say this is a lot of work or this is hard work, the word work inherently doesn't sound very inviting. It sounds tedious and overwhelming. And this is exploration. You know, it, yes, it can feel difficult and hard and confronting. And to enter into our own healing through a mindset of what do I get to explore? And how can this strengthen my connection to my partner, to my family, to my friends, and most importantly, to myself to heal some of those wounds that have been pervasive? It's possible. And I think that's what I really want to inspire anyone listening is it's possible. It takes time. It takes courage. It takes energy. It takes attention. It takes an ability to get uncomfortable. So to lean in and know that it's worth, it's worth the outcome. It also takes good therapists. Yes. I would say now. And so thank you for that. My, my closing thought has to do with this term of trauma. Mm -hmm. which I think is thrown around too much, like many of these psychological terms. I think it's overused. And I've talked to a lot of men about this over the years, and every one of them says, I don't have any trauma. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think we get to being an adult without trauma. And, mm -hmm. and I really like Faith Harper's definition mm -hmm. of trauma is anything that disconnects you from a feeling of safety and security. Mm -hmm. Now, on one hand, that's a pretty low bar for quote unquote trauma. On the other hand, I really like that definition because I think it opens up the doorway to go back in your life, in your childhood in particular, and think about, okay, what, what may have disconnected me from a feeling of safety? And for most of us, there's a ton. Yeah. And so even if you don't want to put the the phrase trauma on it, but maybe difficulty or challenge, those things all add up. Those things have an impact on how you're functioning as an adult now. Those things have an impact on how you're functioning in your romantic relationship right now. Mm -hmm. And until That's why we I can like kind that. of look at those with curiosity, yeah. we're still going to get stuck in these defensive, unconscious, habitual, automatic reactions. That's why I like the word wound. Yeah, that's a good one. I like it because it also feels compassionate. I have a wound here. Yeah. There's pain around this area, but you're right. I, I hear that all the time too from male clients. I don't have any trauma. Yeah. Well, and I think I'm sure females too, because it you don't want to be weak, right? You don't want to, we don't like to think of ourselves like that. No one, well, I shouldn't say no one. Many of us don't like to be viewed as a victim. We don't want to view yeah. ourselves as a victim. And I, I don't know that you have to. I think that just for men growing up in the man box culture alone is going to be enough to disconnect us from a feeling of safety at times. I mean, you know, men think of the fights that we get in as we're growing up. Think of the insults that we get. Think of the posturing that we have to do. Think of the put downs we get from friends all along. Yeah. I, I was talking with a guy in his 50s recently. He's like, oh yeah, shit, I'm, I'm going out with my friends this week. We still do that. Mm. So anyways, I, I think your point is well taken to have the curiosity and the interest and the belief that you deserve it to look back and think what might have left a mark mm -hmm. and how might that be impacting me now in my relationship is a good way to go. Yeah. It's always scary to get vulnerable because if we open up to vulnerability, I could get hurt again. And I yeah. think that's with the the good therapist can hold the container to hold the space of that sensitivity with a lot of love and care. So the couple can develop a new, a new baseline of safety and security and trust with one another. And just to, you know, kind of bring it full circle, we're here at this anniversary of our intensive in which we were at that time still getting stuck in that anxious avoidant trap and mm -hmm. that attachment style that came with those belief systems. And you and I've been talking recently of, wow, look at that. We have a really secure attachment with each other now. Mm -hmm. There's That's a lot of safety there. Yeah. And that doesn't mean we don't get triggered or we don't have insecurities or we don't have wounds resurface. It just means it doesn't feel the same level of dysregulation because that safety and security is there. So thank you for 
Well, thank you for your curiosity and exploration with me. It's been an amazing, amazing year. Yeah, it has. From what we've accomplished. Thank you for sharing your insights, love. And that is it for this episode. Oh, wait, one more thing. Oh, yeah. If this is interesting to you as the listener, we do have our monthly masterclass series, Love Isn't Enough, where each month we do an hour long masterclass on different topics. Um, this upcoming uh, week that uh, when this episode is released is going to be on mindfulness and how being mindless can affect your relationship negatively. Um, when you sign up for the whole year, you get all the previous recordings as well as the entire year for lifetime access. There's exercises so partners can, we look at it as like, have a date night, tune in, mm-hmm. And, you know, look for opportunities for growth. And we are also accepting work with couples who are eager to deepen their connection, who are committed, but stuck, and who hopefully feel inspired by our story of hearing our own journey. So if that's something that you and your partner would like to explore, we would definitely love to connect with you. And you can find out more at loveisntenough.net. Okay, now you can wrap up. Okay, thank you. (laughs) Thank you for interjecting that. And that is it for this episode of the Evolved Caveman podcast. If you like this episode, please be sure to like, rate, review, and share. It helps us to get the word out. It helps us to change the world one one person, one couple at a time. And if you didn't like this episode, you don't have to do a damn thing. Thanks so much. Until next time. Thank you for listening to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. If you like what you've heard, support us by subscribing, leaving reviews, and sharing the podcast with friends and colleagues. For the latest, most powerful tools to connect with like-minded men, join the Facebook group at The Evolved Caveman. Follow Dr. John on Instagram at The Evolved Caveman, all one word, or join the email list by visiting guidetoself.com. 